you father we thank you for today we bless your name for your goodness thank you for your word which supplies every need in our lives we're praying oh lord you touch your people and give understanding to us even today in jesus name thank you lord for the answer in jesus mighty name we pray Today we're coming to Leviticus chapter 11, and we're reading from verse 1. Verse 1, it says, And the Lord spake unto Moses and to Aaron, saying unto them. Look at verse 2. In verse 2, it says, Speak unto the children of Israel, saying, These are the beasts which ye shall eat among all the beasts that are upon the earth. And then from that verse on to the rest of the chapter, in verse 47, he declared to them what he could eat the clean animals, birds and fish and, and the reptiles and the ones that walk on the land and also told them the unclean which they could not eat. Well, we need to understand in 1 Timothy chapter 4, reading now from verse 1, it's telling us about the Christian era. The people that live now after the cross, not only the Gentiles, but even the Jews that were labor after the cross. And what about those clean and unclean animals? It says now, the Spirit speaks expressly that in the latter time, some shall depart from the faith. Understand that? Giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils. Who are those people? What do they say? What do they propound? What do they expand? And what do they teach the people? Look at verse 2. In verse 2 it says, speaking lies and hypocrisy. Having their conscience seared with a hot iron. That is, there are ministers, there are prophets, there are preachers, there are people who will be preaching. And when they preach, they don't all preach by the Holy Ghost, the true scriptures. They do not expound the scriptures by the understanding and enlightenment of the Holy Spirit. They speak lies in hypocrisy. And it says their conscience is seared with a hot iron. And what do they propound? What do they preach as a result of that? Look at verse 3. In verse 3 it says forbidding to marry. Forbidding to marry. Don't get into that snare of forbidding other people to marry. Forbidding your own sons. Forbidding your own daughters and forbidding members of the church to marry and standing in their way. It says, and commanding to abstain from meats which God has created to be received with thanksgiving of them which believe and know the truth. Well, we, we must know the truth. It's not just the truth in Genesis. Uh, the revelation was not complete at that time. The truth in Exodus and Leviticus, the revelation was not complete at that time. But now we have the fullness of the revelation of the truth, of the word of God. And we must believe that truth in fullness and know that truth in fullness and receive what God has given with thanksgiving. Look at this line in verse 4. It says in verse 4, for every creature of God is good and nothing to be refused. Now I come to the fuller revelation. All those animals that were divided into two groups, this group clean and this group unclean, it says all that line of demarcation has been broken down now. When God through Christ broke down the demarcation between the Jews and the Gentiles and brought us all one at the same time, he broke down the demarcation between the clean meat and the unclean clean meat. It says for every creature of God is good and nothing to be refused if it be refused with thanksgiving. Look at verse 5. In verse 5, for it is sanctified. The whole creature, everything now sanctified by the word 
of God and prayer. That is now you, you bring your food to the table and you are not seeing, uh, you know, dividing them. Uh, that's unclean. Snail, that's unclean. Uh, and this one, that's unclean. It says now it is sanctified by the word of God and by prayer. Uh, we, we're looking at the message today, understanding and obeying the word of God. There are three things we're looking at. Number one, we're looking at the comprehension of good feeding uh, by scriptural saints for God's glory. A good feeding. You're feeding yourself. And what does the New Testament and the whole Bible, what does the Bible regard as good feeding for the saints? of God who are scriptural and we do it for God's glory. Number two, the creation of great fowls for special service to God. God created everything and we're going to take part of those things that were mentioned and find out why did God create them. Everything is not for food but it is for service unto God. Number three is the consecration of guileless faithfulness. Our consecration now should have no guile, no hypocrisy, and no deception. Everything should be transparent before the Lord. The consecration of guileless uh, faithfulness in sanctified service. So let's look at number one. Number one, we're looking at the comprehension. That means the understanding. And that's why Paul the Apostle said, Consider what I say, because he had insight into the mysteries of the gospel. He had insight into the revelation, the ultimate revelation of God. And so Paul the Apostle said, consider what I say, and the Lord give you understanding, comprehension in all things. Number one, the comprehension of good feeding by scriptural saints for God's glory. And we're looking at 1 Corinthians chapter 10 and we're looking at verse 31. It says whether therefore ye eat or drink. Don't eat with the mind of a Jew or Gentile. Don't eat with the mind of this one is forbidden. That one is acceptable. It says whether ye eat or drink, do or whatever ye do, do all to the glory of God. Now, in our feeding, in our eating, and everything we do, we do now to the, for the glory of God. When you keep yourself healthy, so you can serve God more, that's for the glory of God. When you avoid anything that endangers your health, that's for the glory of God, because you want to have a good body, and a good mind, and a healthy uh, personality, so that you can serve the Lord without any hindrance. We're dividing this to three parts. Look at number one. Number one is the approved scriptural and proper food for kingdom citizens. Number two, applied separation principles for kingdom citizens. Number three, the acceptable steadfast purity of kingdom citizens. Let's look at number one. Number one, the approved scriptural and the proper food for kingdom citizens. Already we have read uh, Leviticus chapter 11 uh, during our certain scripture Review verses one to seven, but now look at uh, again uh, First Timothy chapter four. I'm reading from verse five. In First Timothy chapter four, reading from verse five, for it is sanctified by the word of God, not by our changing scriptures. We are not the people, uh, by the preacher, by the pastor, by the theologian. The theologian says, "Don't worry, now you can eat everything." No, it's by the word of God and prayer that everything now is sanctified for us. We're looking at Acts of the Apostles chapter 21 verse 25. In Acts chapter 21 verse 25 as touching the Gentiles which believe we have written and concluded that 
at him that they observe no such thing. That is the separation of this meat and that meat. Don't observe that anymore now because the, in the dispensation in which we are, all those things are being cleared for us. And it is safe only, only this, that they keep themselves from things offered to idols. If you know that this is offered to idols, whether it is a clean or unclean, whatever is offered to idol, you will not partake of that. And then it says, I'm from blood. Uh, because the life is in the blood, whether clean animal or not clean animal, if the blood is there, you will not eat the blood. We we'll say this is now for everyone, whether Jew or Gentile, or from strangled. The, the things that are strangled, the idol worshippers, they do not kill those animals the proper way. And they're cruel because of the cruelty they manifest to those animals strangling them. You will not touch that. That's for their idols and from fornication. And then if you read the other part of the Acts, it says, if you keep to this, you do well, farewell. You will farewell. Look at number two. Number two, the applied separation principle for kingdom citizens. Why did the Lord make those laws for them? That he said, separate those animals, this one unclean and this one clean. When I want to have applied separation principle, the principle of separation, yourself separating yourself from the unclean so that you remain clean in the sight of the Lord. We're looking at Romans chapter 15 and in verse 4. In Romans chapter 15 verse 4 it says, for whatsoever things were reaching a part time. Think about that. Whatsoever things were reaching, uh, the writing in Genesis, the writing in Exodus, in Leviticus, they were reaching a part time. The writing in Numbers, Deuteronomy, the Old Testament all together. Whatsoever things were reaching a part time, were reaching for our learning. So, whenever you read anything in the Old Testament, you say, what do I learn from this? When now now, after the cross, after Calvary, after the sacrifice of Jesus for everything we need, and now that we're on this right side of the cross, yet we still have the scriptures of the Old Testament and the scriptures of the New Testament, what do I learn from this? It says that we, through the patience and comfort of the scriptures, they're part of scripture, and all scripture is given by the inspiration of God, and they're profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, that the man of God may be perfect through that uh, and thoroughly established. And so it says we learn something from anything we read in the Old Testament. We must be asking ourselves, what do I learn from this? All right, what are we learning now? From Leviticus chapter 11, verses 1 to 47, what are we learning? Let, let's look at 2 Corinthians chapter 6, and we're reading from verse 17. In 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 17, wherefore come out from among them and be separate, says the Lord, and touch not the unclean thing, and I will receive you. Then in verse 18, it says, and will be a father unto you, and ye shall be my sons and my daughters, says the Lord Almighty. Uh, what we're learning is we separate from everything unclean. The world is unclean, and all their practices, and all their their precepts and all their whatever they are doing, everything is unclean. And the Lord is saying, I showed them by pictures. I showed them by tangible things so that every time they see it at meal, they will remember there must be separation between the clean and the unclean. Have you come to the Lord and you are clean through the word I've spoken unto you every time they sat at meal? The Lord has called us. The Lord has purged us. The Lord has cleansed us. The Lord has made us clean. And it teaches us. 
us in a pictorial way that we should always separate ourselves the clean from the unclean. In James chapter 4, we're looking at verse 4. James chapter 4 verse 4, ye adulterers and adulteresses, know ye not that the a fr that the friendship of the world, the world is unclean, and you are supposed to be clean, and if you are friendly with them, and you copy them, and you live the way they live, then you become the enemy of God. He said, meet you with God whosoever, therefore, will be a friend of the world, and he does not put any difference between the clean, cleansed by the blood of the Lamb, and cleansed but the word that we have learned and he is mingling with the unbelievers and living like they are li living. He says, so, so ever therefore will be a friend of the world is the enemy of God. What are we learning? We're learning everything we see, every time we sit at the table that when those Jews ate, they separate the clean from the unclean and when we live every day because we eat every day they were separated from the unclean. We're looking at number three here. Number three, the acceptable, steadfast purity of kingdom citizens. He wants us to remember that everything unclean has been taken away from us. The food, the animal, the meat, the birds, the fish, everything is taken away. Those wounds that are unclean. And now we're to remain clean and to remain pure. And so we're learning the acceptable, steadfast purity of kingdom citizens. In Psalm 24, I'm reading from verse 3. Who shall ascend into the hill of the Lord? Or who shall stand in his holy place? Please remember, all those the Jews, they were told, if you eat any unclean thing, you'll be cut off. Cut off from the earth and cut off from the presence of God. You'll be cut off from the family of God. It makes them remember. It should make us remember. If we partake of an unclean life, then we're cut off from the Lord. We're cut off from life eternal. That's the reason he was telling them that they should only eat that which was clean. The lesson we learn that the purity we have, the holiness we have, should be steadfast and continue every time and every day. Who then shall ascend to the hill of the Lord? And who shall stand in his holy place? Look at this now. In verse 4 it says, the he that has clean hands not on clean hands. You see the lesson. He doesn't want our hands to be unclean. Our leaves to be unclean. Our walk to be unclean. Our life. Anything about us in business, in discussion, in anything that we do, he doesn't want uncleanness in any area of our lives. Because of the precious blood that has been shed for us, because of the precious word that we have been taught, and we remain clean by the cleansing sin of the blood and by the teaching and learning of the word. He that has clean hands and a pure heart. That's the lesson. That's what he wants from us. That the impure will not be in his presence. It will be cut off because his heart, because his soul, because his lifestyle is unclean. He will not be in the presence of the Lord forever. He must have a pure heart, a pure mind, a pure your soul and in pure principle, lifestyle, and it says, no, not, and he has not lifted up his soul unto vanity, nor sworn deceitfully. Look at First Peter chapter one. We're reading from verse twenty-two. In First Peter chapter one, reading from verse twenty-two, seeing that ye have purified your souls in obeying the truth. You see what is in emphasizing impurity no more there, impurity in lifestyle, impurity in our thinking, in our thoughts, impurity in our planning, impurity in our association in, with anyone, any 
new one in the world. Now we want to understand the reason he gave those injunctions to them is so that impurity, transgression, sin, hypocrisy, anything unclean will not be part of our lifestyle. He says, sin, he have purified your souls in obeying the truth, obeying the truth through the spirit unto unfinch, unpretending, non-hypocrisy love of the brethren that ye love one another with a pure heart fervently. It tells us in verse 23, in verse 23 it says, being born again. We're not born again and we're not uh, minding all the clean and the unclean animals, what we put in the mouth or what we don't put in the mouth. It says, being born again not of corruptible seed but of in Incorruptible, the word of God which liveth and abideth forever. The word that lives, abides now and forever. Those words, they are discarded. It's part of the ceremonial law. And when Jesus died on the cross of Calvary, all those ceremonial laws are no more relevant to the believer. But the word of God that lives and abides forever. We're looking at point number two now. Point number two, we're looking at the creation. The creation of great fowls for special service to God. Uh, you remember, look at Leviticus chapter 11, we're looking at verse 13. It says, and these are they which shall be in abomination. You hold them, you shall have them in abomination among the fowls. They shall not be eaten. This one, they will not be eating. Why did God create them if he didn't want us to eat? You understand now as we read the scriptures, it says they shall not be eating. They are an abomination. The eagle, look at that. And the ostrich and, and the ostrich and the asprey. Then he then he tells us in verse 14, in verse 14, the vulture and the kite after his kind. Look at verse 15. Verse 15, every raven of every size, of every of every species, it says, and it after his kind, we will not eat those things. Look at verse 18. In verse 18, it says, and the swine and the and the pelican and the gear eagle. It tells us in Revelation chapter 4, reading from verse 11, it tells us, Thou art worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power, for thou hast created all things, all people, created all things, even the, you know, the stars, he created all things, the sun and the moon, and all the reptiles and all the animals, anything living, anything inanimate, all the trees, the forest, everything, he has created everything for himself, for thy pleasure, and they are and they were created for his pleasure, for his service, because he can use any of them. We're coming now to uh, three things here. Number one, we're coming to the raven, one of the unclean animals, not consumable. They are not to be eaten, but useful in God's creation. Number two, the camel, not to be eaten by those Israelites because it's one of the unclean animals for them. It says the camels not to be eaten, but used commonly. And then number three, the reason for not consuming some things 
as new creatures. Let's come to number one. Number one, we're looking at the raven, not consumable, but useful in God's creation. We've read that already in Leviticus chapter 11, reading from verse 13 to verse 15. Now, let's come to 1 Kings chapter 17. 1 Kings chapter 17 verse 4, it says, And it shall be that thou shalt drink of the brook, and I have commanded the ravens to feed thee there. And you are going to set yourself apart. Israel is unclean. Israel has followed after Baal, and Ahab and Jezebel has made them unclean in my sight. You are clean. You are my servant. Come apart. You will be at this brook. And Elijah did not have to ask, what will I eat? Look at this. I have commanded the ravens to feed thee there. We are not to eat. They were not to eat the ravens. And yet, God has use of the ravens. So you cannot say, since we don't uh, eat uh, ravens as, as Israelites, then there's no use for them. There's use for them, even apart from feeding. Look at verse 5. In verse 5, it says, So he went and did according unto the word of the Lord. For he went and dwelt by the brook Cherith, I, that is before Jordan. Then verse 6, in verse 6, and the ravens, not only one, maybe they took turns, but the Lord commanded them. And he knew their time to go to Elijah. And it says, and the ravens brought him bread and flesh. God provided bread and flesh all those about three years that the famine stayed part of the time, a year or more, at the brook, and part of the time in the widow's house. But at that time it was by the brook, it was the ravens that brought him bread and flesh in the morning, and bread and flesh in the evening, and he drank of the brook. The point is, God created all those animals, and although the Jews were told that they should not eat the ravens, yet God has a reason for creating them and a time for making use of them. Look at Luke chapter 12. In Luke chapter 12, we're reading from verse 24. It says, Consider the ravens, for they neither sow nor reap, which neither have storehouse nor barn, and God feedeth them. How much more are ye better than the fowls? All the fowls that God said the Israelites should not use, if they went out of existence, the Jews will lose nothing because they are not eating them. And so if they were not preserved, if they were not taken care of, the Jews will not lose anything in their diets. But the Lord maintained all those files. Why? Because he has need of them. He has, he has use for them. And so we learn a great lesson here. There are people that will say, okay, if we should not uh, drink, why, why did God create all those things that will make the strong drink and the alcohol from? He has use for them. He didn't make them so that you can get drunk, so that you can be intoxicated. And so that, you know, your life will be upside down. And, you know, sometimes iron, iron is made. And iron from iron will make quite a lot of other things like gun, like machete, like knife. And, okay, since God has created this, that means I can use the machete not to kill. Already he said thou shalt not kill. And so that is not for the, the purpose why God created those things. Anything we're going to use when we asking God, why did you create this and how can I use this? I know it's for use one way 
way or the other. But not everything is not for cons consumption. That's what the baby's children think. When the children are calling, anything are crawling, anything they find, they want to put in their mouth. And the mother that will say, no, that is not for food. That is not for eating. Why are they there? They have their reasons, but not for food. We're coming to number two. Number two, the camel, not to be eaten, but used commonly. We're looking at Leviticus chapter 11, and we're reading from verse 1. It says, Nevertheless, we shall ye not eat of them that chew the cord, or of them that divide the hoof. Those two things. It's a lesson for us chewing the cord, reading the word, chewing the word, meditating on the word, masticating at the word so that the word will become part of your system. And Parting the hoof, separation from the world. And the Lord said, if an animal uh, was chewing the cord, but he not part the hoof, it's unclean. That means those of us who read the Bible, learn from the Bible, and meditate on the Bible, if we don't part from the world, we are unclean in the sight of God. On the other hand, if the animal parts the hoof but does not chew the cord, that he is, is separated from the world, I will not do that. I will not, I will not do that. But he does not chew the cord. He does not read the word, meditate on the word, and live by the word. And he does not know the revelation of God because he does not chew the cord. He does not read the Bible. It's also unclean for any one of us for a leader, for a member, for a citizen kingdom to be clean in the sight of the Lord is reading the Bible. He loves the Bible. He chews the cord and he meditates and swallows the word whole so that he knows the revelation of God and then the implication of chewing the cord. He also parts from the world. He separates from the world. His practice and everything that he does is planned he doesn't have anything to deal with copying the world or living like the world. Those two things together, not separately, together, those are the things that mark clean believers and clean ministers. Let's come back to this, verse 4. It says in verse 4, Nevertheless, we shall ye not eat of them that show the court only, but you don't part the hoof, or of them that divide the hoof, but you not chew the cord as the camel, because he chews the cord, and but divided not the hoof. It is unclean unto you. Now the camel. Uh, they should not eat the camel. It's considered unclean for them. But the camel, why would God create the camel? Uh, let's look at Genesis chapter 24. And we're reading from verse 61. And Rebekah arose and her themselves and they rode upon the camels. They rode upon the camels. And it says, and they followed the man. And the servant took Rebekah and went his way. Look at verse 62. In verse 62 it says, and I say came from the way of the well to Lahai Roy. And for he dwelt in the south of the country. We're told in verse 63 and I seek went out of the to meditate in the field at the eventide. And he lifted up his eyes and saw and behold the camels, the camels were coming. Then in verse 64, it says, Rebecca lifted up her eyes and went, and when she saw Isaac, she lighted off the camel. She was on the camel. There was no car and there was uh, no aeroplane and there was no ship and so their means of transportation was the camel 
they shouldn't eat the camel, but the camel is not useless. It's not for consumption. It's not for eating, but it's for transportation. And so we need to know from God, why was this created? Why was that created? Everything is not for food, but there are those for transportation. There are those for special duties by the Almighty God. In verse 65, verse 65 tells us, For she had said unto the servant, What manner is this that walketh in the field to meet us? And the servant had said, It is my master. Therefore, she took a veil and covered herself. We're looking at Matthew chapter 3, and we're reading from verse 4. Matthew chapter 3, we're looking at verse 4. It says, The same John had his raiment of camel's hair. Of camel's hair. They were not eating the camel, but the skin was good for, uh, for clothing. And for sometimes what we see to honor, the, the, the camel is good, the, the skin is good for that. And so we understand that uh, we need to check up, is this edible? Will this help me and uh, improve on my health if I eat it? Or is there another use I put to it? Very, very important. We're looking at number three. Number three, we're looking at the reason for not consuming some things as new creatures in Christ. We're looking at uh, second, uh, First Peter chapter 2, and we're reading from verse 9. First Peter chapter 2, verse 9, but here a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, and holy nation, a peculiar people, that ye should show forth the praises of him that has called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. The reason why God has not allowed us to do, uh, to eat this and eat that and all that, is not, um, you know, because uh, he didn't know when he was creating them, he knew. But he says, why peculiar generation, why holy nation. Now, let me bring in this. In the world in which we live now, more than 6,000 years have gone. Since creation, and apart from animal and all that, uh, there are things that have happened in those uh, 6,000 years till today. Number one, there is air pollution. And because of the air pollution, because of all these industries and everything, uh, uh, there are things now uh, they will say, you, will, you must not cut down the trees. You must preserve the forest. Deforestation that is cutting down and making allowance for people to live will endanger the purity of the air will breathe. And so, all those, it's not religion now, it is the fact that for these thousands, thousands of years, the air has been polluted by all those industries. Those things were not there at that time. Number two, the seas now where uh, the fishes are, the fish of a different species is what they are. There is uh, what is called mercury. That and those uh, there are some fish that uh, they, are, they are infected by those uh, do, the mercury. And when human beings consume the fish or the mercury, you'll not see them. They're just in the system. It's very dangerous for the body. That's the reason why you'll be selective because God wishes and God wants that your being health in perfect health as your soul prospers. The telephone we use, the telephone we use uh, as, uh, you know, the waves and all that. And when you put that on yourself, you know, sometimes you are sitting down and you always put the phone on your lap. Or you put it when you are, when you are sleeping, you have used the phone and you put it on your chest. Or you even put it near you when you are sleeping. The, the waves that come from those telephones, 
because they can be dangerous to your body. And so it's not just, uh, it is not religion, it is for our health. And if you're using the computer and you glue your eyes on the computer every time, they tell us that it affects your eyesight. And because of that, if you're wearing glasses, uh, you know, the optician will ask you whether you use computers often or not. And if you say you do, they say, okay, we can put something, an anti glare. They can put it on the glasses so that the television, the, the, uh, the tablets, and everything on the computer will not affect your eyesight too much. Sometimes they can even put a shade there just to protect us. You see, all these things we need to take care of. What will endanger my health? What will hinder my, you know, being myself completely? That's the reason why a Christian, a believer, should understand. All those days, thousands of years, the telephones were not there. And now they're using a G5 on the internet, I think. And the waves that come out from G3, that was low, and G4, that was a little bit higher. But it says, so can I have fast service? And any time you want to search for something, it will come up very quickly. Now they have gone to G5. It's already there. And those things you need, we use them. We use telephone. We use uh, tablets. We use all that. But we protect ourselves from the danger that can come from those good, good things. Now for the food. If you, as you are thinking about the food, if you have, for example, uh, maybe diabetes and sh sugar, uh, high sugar level, and then you are stopping yourself with sugary things. It's not only the sugar you put in your tea or the sugar you put in your meal, the sugar in some of the fruits, some of the fruits, some real concentration of sugar. And you love them. I like that taste. I do too, but it will weaken your system. There's something they call cholesterol now, and if that one is so much, and there are foods that, that bring, the, that make you to have too much of cholesterol and because of that for your own health because the body is made in a particular way to respond or to react to whatever we eat and uh, some people say jokingly that that man is digging his grave with his teeth or that woman digging a grave with uh, you know her, uh, her teeth I have liberty I'm not uh, under any Jewish law. I can eat anything and everything now. Moderate that liberty so that the liberty does not destroy your health. You will not die before your time. Let, let's look at Titus chapter 2 and I'm reading from verse 14. Titus chapter 2 reading from verse 14. Who gave himself for us that he might redeem us from all iniquity and purify unto himself a peculiar people zealous of good works. Nothing will kill your zeal in Jesus name. We're coming to point number 3 now. Point number 3 where we we're looking at the consecration of guileless faithfulness in sanctified service to God. We're coming to Leviticus chapter 11 and we're reading from verse 44. It says, For I am the Lord your God. Ye shall therefore sanctify yourselves and ye shall be holy, for I am holy. Neither shall ye defile yourselves. Now he connects the holiness with uh, what he had said in the whole chapter. You will not defile yourself with any manner of creeping sin that creepeth upon the earth. We are dividing this to three parts. Number one, we are looking at the discernment and diligence of God's servants. Number two, the declaration against defilement by God's standard bearing. 
generous. And number three, our dedication to the dispensation of the glorious Savior. Let's look at number one. Number one, we're looking at the discernment and the diligence of go of God's servants. In Leviticus chapter uh, chapter 11 verse 45, look at verse 45. It says, for I am the Lord that bringeth you up out of the land of Egypt for uh, to be your God. Ye shall therefore be holy for I am holy. And he wants us to have discernment. What will make me unholy? What will make me not be totally clean as I ought to be totally clean? We're looking at Isaiah chapter 6 reading from verse 3. Isaiah chapter 6 verse 3. And one cried unto another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of course, the whole earth is full of his glory. Look at verse 4. In verse 4 it says, And the post of the door moved at the voice of him that cried, and that cried, and the house was filled with smoke. Verse 5, verse 5 says, Then said I, Woe is me, for I am undone, because I am a man of unclean lips. I don't eat unclean animal, unclean bird, as a Jew, I say. But he said, even though I don't eat the unclean, I look at my life, I look at my speech, he says, I have unclean leaves, and I dwell in the midst of the people of unclean leaves. All these uh, Jewish people, they're not eating unclean animals, but there's something that matters beyond eating unclean animal and that is their leaves unclean the prophet and the people leave some clean for mine eyes have seen the king the lord of hosts look at verse 6 in verse 6 then flow one of the seraphims unto me having a live coal in his hand which he had taken with the tongues from off the altar look at verse 7 and he laid it upon my mouth and said lo this as touched thy lips. This one came from heaven. This one, you couldn't do this by yourself. You couldn't clean up your lips by yourself. But the uh, the, the element of fire, of coal from heaven, has touched thy leaves, and thine iniquity is taken away, and thy sin purged. Even if you are very careful as to your diet, and nothing unclean, and nothing unhealthy enters into your diet, if your language is unclean, if your leaves are unclean, if your tongue is unclean, if your personality, your life, private and, and public, if they are unclean, then you cannot get to heaven. That you are not eating something unclean, something unhealthy, will keep you healthy here bodily on earth. But heaven demands that all that internal part, internal life is cleansed. Look at verse 8. In verse 8, it says also, I heard the voice of the Lord after the cleansing of the lips, after the purging of the sin, after the sanctification in experience, I heard the voice of the Lord saying, whom shall I send? Or who will go for us? All the Jews were there. They were not eating unclean animals. Not eating those unclean animals did not qualify them to become the prophets of God or to become the servants of God. Yes, keep yourself healthy, but that's natural. The one that is spiritual is that you are made holy, you are purified, you are purged, you are sanctified, and the original, the root of sin is taken away. The depravity is taken away. And now the Lord can ask, whom shall I send and who will go for us? Then said I, here am I. My leaves are clean now. My tongue is clean now. My language is clean now out of the abundance of the heart. The mouth speaketh. My heart is cleansed now. Here am I. 
send me. I pray he will send us. He will send you. And he will prosper his work in your hand in Jesus' name. Now, how are we cleansed now? How are we made holy now? Shall we wait for an angel from heaven to bring a fire and then touch our leaves? First Peter chapter 1, reading from verse 15. In First Peter chapter 1, verse 15, but as he which has called you is holy, so be ye holy in all manner of conversation in verse 16 it said because it is written be ye holy for I am holy look at verse 18 in verse 18 it says for as much as she know that ye were not redeemed or cleansed or purged or purified with corruptible things such as silver and gold from your vain conversation received by tradition Tradition from your fathers, verse 19, it said, But with the precious blood of Christ, as of a lamb, without blemish and without spot. We're looking at number two here. Number two is the declaration against defilement by godly standard bearers. It tells us in Leviticus chapter 11, reading from verse 46. Leviticus 11 verse 46. This is the law of the beast and of the fowl and of every living creature that moveth uh, uh, in the waters and in every uh, creature that creepeth upon the earth. In verse 47, verse 47 to make a difference between the unclean and the clean, and between the bees that may be eating and the bees that may not be eating. The word, important word there is to make a difference. God makes the difference between the clean and the unclean. The unclean man and the clean man, he makes a difference. The unclean preacher and the clean preacher, he makes a difference. He says, I make a difference in all the creatures of the earth, whether they are animals or they are men or anything. I make a difference between the clean and the unclean. And he wants a minister, he wants the standard bearer to also be able to make a difference between the clean and the unclean. Mark chapter 7, we're reading from verse 20. In Mark chapter 7 verse 20, and he said, that which cometh out of the man that defileth the man. Verse 21, it says in verse 21, for from within, out of the heart of men, proceed evil thoughts, adulteries, fornications, murders. You see those Jews, they only took care of the clean, unclean animal. The thoughts that come from them, that make them unclean, the actions of life in them that makes them unclean, they didn't think about all that. Look at verse 22. In verse 22, thefts, covetousness, wickedness, deceit, lasciviousness, and evil eye, blasphemy, pride, foolishness. All those Jews did not think about that. All those uh, Pharisees and Sadducees and the Sanhedrin, uh, you know, the stage, uh, the desert in Moses' seat, and all they were thinking about is uh, clean food, unclean food, and how you wash your hand, and how you wash your feet anytime you come from the market. But all these things that plague their lives, that made their lives unclean, they didn't think about them. Verse 23, it says in verse 23, all these evil things, it says all these evil things, more evil than the raven, and more evil than the camel, and more evil than the pigs, the swine, that they were not eating, it says, all these uh, sinful things, evil things come from within, and defile the man, the clean minister. 
and the called minister and the one that stands for God and for Christ. You preach instead of Christ and you're pleading with the people, be ye reconciled unto God. We must keep ourselves clean from all these evil things that defile the man or the minister. In Revelation chapter 21, we're looking at verse 8. Revelation chapter 21, and we're looking at verse 8. It says, but the fearful, the unbelieving, and the abominable, and the murderers, and the allmongers, and the sorcerers, and the idolaters, and all that shall have their part in the lake which burneth with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. Now, in this our dispensation, eating this or not eating that, eating that or not, you know, rejecting that, that one does not have anything to do now with heaven. This is just for your body. This is just for your health. But these are the things that make a man unclean, a minister unclean, a servant of God unclean, a member of the church unclean. And if those things are there and they are not cleansed away and taken away by the cleansing blood of the Lamb, although I don't drink wine, I don't drink a strong drink, I don't smoke, but if these ones are there, this will hinder anybody, a man, a woman, a member of the church, a great uh, flamboyant uh, uh, testifier. I testify, I'm not touching this in my jury journal. No, it's totally unclean. It will turn my brain. You're not drinking that, you're not smoking that, but this is there. This is going to spell hell fire at last. Look at verse 27. In verse 27, it tells us, and there shall in no wise enter into it anything that defileth, neither whatsoever worketh abomination or maketh a lie, but they which are written in the Lamb's book of life. We're looking at number three now. Number three, we're looking at our dedication to the dispensation of the glorious Savior. We're now in a new dispensation. And in the dispensation we live is for the Jew, is for the Gentile. And we come as a single family of God. We dedicate ourselves to the dispensation of the glorious Savior. We're coming to 1 Corinthians chapter 9 and we read from verse 16, 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 16, For though I preach the gospel, I have nothing to glory of, for necessity is laid upon me. Yea, woe is unto me if I preach not the gospel. Look at verse 17. In verse 17, For if I do this willingly, I have a reward. But if against my will, a dispensation of the gospel, dispensation, a dispensation of the gospel is, com is committed unto my hands. That's why in um, Acts of the Apostles chapter 10, we're reading there from verse 13, in this new dispensation, it's not no more uh, the meat is clean or the meat is not clean. Look at this, Acts chapter 10, verse 13. And there came a voice to him, Rise, Peter, kill and eat. In verse 14, and but Peter said, Not so, Lord. Peter was claiming to know the scriptures more than the Lord. He was claiming to know, and he remembered Leviticus chapter 11. No, Lord, I cannot do that. I know the word inside out. He didn't understand the new dispensation we're talking about. He said, no, not so, not so, Lord, for I have never eaten anything that is common or unclean. Look at verse 15. In verse 15, and the voice speak unto him again the second time. What God 
hast cleansed that call not thou common. Now, there is new dispensation. All that barrier, the line of demarcation between clean animal and unclean animal, what you can eat, what you cannot eat, that wall has been broken down. And therefore, now that the Lord has broken, collapsed that wall, and everything now is available, and you can eat whatever you, can, you want to eat, if it doesn't endanger your health. Look at verse 16. In verse 16, this was done thrice, and the vessel was received up again unto he into heaven. And then in verse 17, verse 17 now, while Peter doubted in himself, watch this vision which he had seen it should mean, behold the man which was sent from Cornelius, a gentle had made inquiry for Simon's house and stood before the gate. Look at verse 18. In verse 18, and called and asked whether Simon, which uh, was surnamed Peter, was there. Uh, there were uh, lodged were lodged there in verse 19. Verse 19 says, While Peter thought on the vision, the Spirit says unto him, Behold, three men seek for thee. And the Spirit of God confirmed that the Lord God of heaven has removed the demarcation between the clean animal, the unclean animal. But understand, the Lord was applying the to the Gentile, whom the Jews called unclean, to be brought into the kingdom. That now the Jews apparently they thought they were clean. The Gentiles they thought those were unclean. The Lord had broken down the partition, clean, unclean. You can come together now. You can worship together. You can believe on the Lord Jesus together. That's what the Lord was saying. Three men seek for thee. And then in verse 20. In verse 20, it says, Arise, therefore. That's the Spirit talking. Arise, therefore, and get thee down, and go with them, doubting nothing, for I have sent them. That's how eventually the Gentiles had the word of God. In Ephesians chapter 3, we're looking at it from verse 2. Ephesians chapter 3, verse 2. Remember, the new dispensation, the middle wall of partition is broken down. The clean people, the unclean people, the Jewish people, the Gentiles, they're now together saved by the blood of the Lamb. It's telling us, if ye have heard of the dispensation of the grace of God, the dispensation of the grace of God that now brings everybody under the same atoning blood of Jesus Christ as taking away all the differences or differentiation between us and them, between they and us, if you have heard of the dispensation of the grace of God, which has given me to you what? In verse 3, it says how that by revelation he made known unto me the mystery, as I wrote afore, that is before this time, in few words, look at verse 4, in verse 4 it says, whereby when you read, ye may understand and my knowledge in the mystery of Christ. Verse 5, verse 5, which in other ages was not made known unto the sons of men. In other ages, the wall that divided the Jews and the Gentiles was very thick and nothing could bring them together. And so it was not like that in those ages, but now it says as it is now revealed Revealed unto his holy apostles, not only to me, Paul, even Peter had that same revelation. And all the apostles now they understand that everyone that believes on the Lord Jesus Christ um, would have, um, would have rejected all those other things. The wall is broken down, and now we believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and Jesus makes us one new man. And the prophets by the Spirit. Look at verse six. In verse six, it tells us that the Gentiles shall be fellow 
heirs, fellow heirs of the Jews, they are no more relegated to background, and they are no more seen. The Jews has no right to say now, all the Gentiles will perish. They will be, uh, they will be foiled for fire, for fire, uh, for fire, they will be uh, firewood for the fire. No, now we can get to heaven. Now we can believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, the same Christ that saves the Jew, now saves the Gentile. And the middle world is uh, broken down, and we cannot say the saved Gentiles are unclean. We cannot say that anymore. The Lord has cleansed the saved Gentiles, and we cannot say the saved Jews are unclean. No, because now the blood of Jesus cleanses everyone from sin. And then it says, and of the same body, of the same body, we're now together. There's no division, demarcation anymore. Clean, unclean, all that is wiped away. Our partakers of the promise in Christ by the gospel. And now that's why you are partakers now. Anything a Jew could have, anything Abraham could have, anything Moses could have, anything Joshua could have, now you can have. Anything Elijah David could have. Anything Elisha could have. Anything Samuel could have. Any grace Isaiah could have. Any, any, any grace that Jeremiah or Ezekiel could have. Now everything is available for you. In fact, anything Peter or John or James, the Old and the New Testament believers, anything they could have, everything is available for you now. And yours will be the promise in Christ. And all the promises of God in Christ are yea and amen. To be fulfilled in your life, in my life, in our lives together, in Jesus' name. And whatever you need of the grace of God, God to be what the Lord has determined you will be. There is no word of demarcation anymore. You will receive in Jesus' name. Even tonight, even tonight, even tonight, the grace of God multiplied in your life. The love of God multiplied in your life and everything Calvary has provided for anyone in any generation is now available for you. For me, for me, you will not be poor spiritually in Jesus. Let's rise up now and take whatever we have learned to the Lord in prayer. And the Lord will answer your prayer as he, would, as he answered the prayers of all those people in other generations. Because we're now in a new dispensation.